we wanted to cover about Riverox Saban. Why? Because yes, it is a NOAC and it is one of the most commonly frequently used NOAC in fact. So what is NOAC actually? NOAC stands for New Oral Anticoagulants. So the main reason comes, why are we trying to talk about it? So since we had already said it, uh, dapigatrin has become a generic drug. So other than that, one of the uh, really uh, drug with which we have had maximum experience as well in the medical field is rivaroxaban. So let's try to see in the practical aspects. So what are the things available? So we had already said uh, what we have been using since decades, I would say, is vitamin K antagonists like the acinocumarol or the warfarin. But they all have their own problems as well. Like, for example, the response can be unpredictable, the therapeutic range is really low, and even when you are trying to give it to a person or patient, you have to monitor them as well. So you must monitor them uh, uh, routinely. And then you have to also modify the dosages as well for that. Okay. So what are the other NOACs do you all know of? Try to use the chat box and write over there. Okay. Try to write in the chat box. So what are the other NOACs you all know of? Hello. Haha, good afternoon. Okay, great. Can I speak to you after three? Within one hour, I'll speak to you, okay? I'll give you a call back. Okay. Hello? So, do you all remember the other NOACs? What were the other NOACs which we all are using it? So, what are the other NOACs? You all have forgotten. I think what we have, okay, Davigatran, okay, great. And? Apixaban, wonderful. And? Idoxaban, wonderful, wonderful. So I'm really happy. So at least you all remember my lectures from the earlier times. So what we were talking about the limitations. So yes, even when you have started warfarin as well, you must give a bridge therapy, especially using the heparins in fact. And the other problem as well with the vitamin K antagonist is there are a lot of drug to drug interaction and also drug to food interactions as well. And yes, there are plenty of chances of bleeding chances as well so that was the reason uh, we had been trying to think or trying to invent a newer medicine which should be uh, not be having all these problems and it should be efficacious as well so that's how we have come up a group of newer drugs which is called as noax and that's where we will try to see so what about this NOAC as well? What is going to happen? So what are the safety concerns? So way back in 2013, so we were trying to sit with some of my colleagues in uh, Australia and that's how this paper had come up. So initially we tried to compare dabigatrin versus warfarin. Okay, so what are the clinical, clinically affected parameters? I would really recommend everyone to go through this paper and really read about it in detail. And in fact, after this, we were really requested by the editor himself to also include Rivaroxaban as well. So we have tried to compare Rivaroxaban versus Warfarin versus Dabicatrin, okay? But yes, in a special setup. Special setup was in terms of patient who is undergoing a catheter ablation for the atrial fibrillation. And that's where we had tried to compile the data and try to do the comparison. So there are definitely several unique advantages with this drug as well. So what are the unique advantages of this drug? They are the rapid onset and the amount of dosage what we have to use is comparatively really low. Lower dosage means, for example, if you all will remember for the dabigatrin, you have to use 110, 150 milligram because a lot of amount of the drug 
gets you know in the first metabolize the first metabolism it gets tends to get wasted so the bioavailability of the drug in our blood is really low for this then it doesn't get much affected with the food intake so if you want to have a good bioavailability especially for medicine like dabigatrin you must eat after the food so that's a very important factor similarly Although, uh, if you all will remember, for dabigatrin, we have to prescribe this medicine, or even for apixaban as well, it should be a BD dosage, okay? But rivaroxaban needs only once daily dosage. Then, uh, when in the statistics as well, when we have tried to compare, what about those uh, minor bleeding rates? Trying to compare it to dabigatrin, we have seen the minor bleeding rates are much better for da for rivaroxaban and in fact if you have come across a ischemic a ischemic patient having a or even a stroke patient with a ischemic etiology rivaroxaban should be preferred i would say so what are the clinical conditions if there are various clinical conditions first thing uh, the novax has also been tried actually for the venous thromboembolism basically Later on, yes, for the deep vein thrombosis treatment and its recurrence prevention and also for prevention of stroke and systemic embolism. So do you all remember what is the exact dosage for this? I hope you can see in the slides and I would really like you all to go through it and uh, let me know, okay? So you all have to really, because I want these answers, just, just a bit, just try to go through and let me know. So what are the uh, dosages, different connecting dosages you should be using? Just let me know, okay? Just go through this. Hello? Hello? Ha ha, ha ha. Hey. Then make it 10 mg. 10 mg. Start from 10 mg. Huh. Okay. Think that 10 to 15 should be the therapeutic doses for SVD. But start from 10 and we will see. Okay. Thank you. So, do you all remember? So, what? Okay. See, normally everyone thinks, tends to think is that rivaroxaban is only reserved only for the OD dosage. But there are some special clinical conditions in which you have to use the BD dosage. And when is that is? For the, if the patient already has DVT, otherwise, if once patient had DVT and you want to prevent its recurrence as well, that is the time. Or for, similarly for the pulmonary embolism. So if you want to treat Otherwise, if you want to prevent its recurrence, that is the time you have to initiate with 15 milligram BD for three weeks. And later on, after that, so the overall dosage, which was of 30 mg OD, uh, because you are giving 15 milligram twice daily, right? So then you, you come down further to 20 milligram OD. That will be the continuation dosage. And that, that dosage you can continue for almost three months. So then, uh, for the prevention of venous thromboembolism, you can give a much lower dosage, which is 10 mg OD itself. Yeah, normally it was being given a more preferred for the major surgery, which is hip replacement surgery. For the knee replacement surgery, the indications has been going down, in fact. So although uh, it is advocated for almost like two weeks, but uh, in practical grounds, I don't see it much. Now coming for the prevention for of systemic embolism. So in that, you try to give is the 15 milligram, but for only for the patients with renal disimpairment. Otherwise, the standard dosage is 20 milligram. Okay. And coming to the duration of the therapy, if the patient has a non-valvular atrial fibrillation, you must be able to start it and continue with it as well. So you should not at all stop in between. So that's what, I, as I was tell, telling to you all in the non-valvular AF. So you have to give them like this. Okay, so uh, yeah. 
start with 20 milligram you can go for a lower dosage only if you know the patient has uh, any renal dysfunction but you must be able to also know if the patient has a valvular EF otherwise patient has also history of rheumatic heart disease it may not be advisable there are some clinical studies which is going on and there are some positive uh, seems to be some positive uh, benefits but it may take a lot of time uh, so there's a lot of time in the sense it may take a lot of time for the conclusive benefits to come which may be seen so that's what i would say so now what about the river oxaban for stroke prevention in non valvular ef so as i had already said it 20 mg is the better one but if someone is having renal problems then you have to continue like this for the venous thromboembolism as i had already said it if you want to treat so someone is already having a dvt episode so then you have to give 15 mg BD for 3 weeks and then you have to reduce down to 20 mg OD. And you have to continue it for at least 3 months. And then you also have to, in the meantime, whenever you start such anticoagulation, you always need to see for transient other risk factors as well, which are recent surgery, trauma or immobilization. And the longer duration also tends to depend upon the other risk factors as well you know whether it is a pulmonary embolism is also associated or is it like a idiopathic deep vein thrombosis as well so so once you already know about the treatment but what about the long-term secondary prevention for the long-term secondary prevention the same thing applies is up to three weeks 15 milligram BD dosage and after three weeks, you can give 20 milligram OD dosage. But always remember, for such patients who have renal impairment, try to go a little bit lower than the advised one. Okay. And uh, yeah, the other thing as well, you need to know about the duration. For the duration of the anticoagulation, it typically varies from three months, six months, and up to 12 months after their first event. And although if there is recurrence of the events, then you may have to consider thinking if possible for the lifelong as well. So what about the other common questions? It happens like this that there is already a patient on warfarin or any of the vitamin K antagonists or maybe even acinochromer oil as well. And you are thinking of converting them, that gentleman or the lady, from the vitamin K antagonist to the river rocks band. How do you do that? So always the best thing is, is you have to stop the warfarin. Once the INR comes less than 2.5 or 3, that is the time you can start the river rocks band. Okay. What about the vice versa? In the sense, uh, if someone is on river rocks band and you are thinking of putting them on vitamin K antagonist, so what will you do for that? So for that, uh, what you can do is, is you have to start the warfarin that moment itself, whenever you want to do. And then once the INR becomes more than two, then you can stop the warfarin, uh, the river oxaban actually, because now the warfarin has overtaken in the therapeutic level effect in fact, okay. So, just starting those patients on the uh, uh, these medicines is not enough. You also need to do them a regular follow-up. And why you need to do a regular follow-up is because they are anticoagulants. And then what can happen is these patients can bleed. They can have the complications as well. So, that is why. And we need to understand those patients who are on uh, anti, uh, like arrhythmias as well, especially atrial fibrillation, these patients are very, very fragile. So they really have a higher chances of bleeding rates as well. So you also need to, whenever they come for follow-up to you, you have to ensure uh, there is compliance. They are, they are, you are also trying to watch out for the side effects. Mm -hmm. And what about those co-medications that patients are taking? And you also have to keep on seeing for the blood sampling in the sense is the patient also developing any renal or liver function problems as well 
So now coming to the lab testing. So what are the lab tests you're going to advise for such kind of patients? So what happens is, I think you all will be able to understand, we are not advising any INR testing for this. Why don't we advise INR? Anyone would like to say? Or you all can even use the chat box as well. So why don't we use INR for the testing? So if you all will remember, INR was actually de uh, developed for vitamin K antagonists. So that's why those factors are different for the vitamin K antagonists and for this. So that is the reason. So INR can be used for the vitamin K antagonists. But Rivaroxaban is not a vitamin K antagonist. So that is the reason. So why if you want to check its uh, functionality or if you want to measure it, then what you can do is you can ask for a fac anti factor 10 a chromogenic assay. You can ask for so it is commercial kits are available for that and you may also ask for pt or apt appt or if even if you have asked inr as well it may be increased it's not that it has to be increased but it may be increased as well but they are not the best tests to uh, check for its efficacy so other than that what else so what are the other tests you can use you may also use something is called as PT. Okay. Otherwise, in uh, in Europe, I really remember there were tools what is called as calibrators. So calibrators were are available, uh, but in um, I know in Western countries, I'm not yet sure if it is available in uh, you know South Asia or the Middle East as well. But it's a great tool as well uh, if you want to calibrate. So for example, how much about the dosing or the frequency as well, if it needs to be increased or decreased. And then it needs to be done okay so if you all have any questions about that feel free to uh, write me on the text uh, group so now compare to the other groups so what are those different factors how are they getting influenced if you will try to do a blood testing so this is how the the thing is the influence basically depends upon the drug concentration the reagents and also the assays So this is again the same thing which we had already spoken and summarized well before. So what happens is that how much is the dosage which we should be using. Okay. I hope you all will remember very well. And now this is another beautiful slide. I have, it is there especially to compare Rivaroxaban, Apixaban and Dabigantrin okay so if we all can say the immediate effect for the drug is the quickest effect is for apixaban so rivaroxaban can take two to four hours after you have initiated okay and yes INR cannot be used for its usage aptt it's not advisable but it can be used a little bit for dabigatrin yes it can give a slight mm -hmm. Uh, effect uh, and yes fa anti factor 10a assay can be done especially for the river oxaban although for apixaban and dabigatrin there's no data available so dabigatrin i hope you all will remember so what was the antidote which is available for the dabigatrin so what is the antidote which is available for as a to counteract the effect of dabigatrin So it is called as Pradaxa Bind. So that's the commercial name. So what is its generic name? So its generic name is Edra Suzimab, right? I think you all have already forgotten. Okay, good, good, good. I'm I'm happy. So someone remembers that. Okay. So a common typical situation comes. Yeah. To us as well, a lot of times is when someone comes and says like, oh, I have a missed dose. So doctor, I forgot to take the dosage. So what shall I do? 
So what to do for such kind of conditions? So you always have to see is if uh, if the patient is on once daily dosage. So if someone has already forgotten, what you should advise them is immediately retake the dose and continue on the following dose with the OD dosage what that person was supposed to be. But if someone has missed it, it should not be done like this. You have to take double of the dosage. No, don't do like that. The person will be much more predisposed for the complications. Similarly, if the patient is taking twice uh, BD dosage, so what should be done? So what should be done is immediately, whenever that patient re remembers, immediately take the dosage, but don't increase the frequency in the sense like if you are taking it BD, don't do it like this. You take three pills of that. No, it's not good. That's not the way. Just take it immediately as soon as possible and then continue with a normal dosage. So, and then happens is, what about the other contraindications? What are the areas when rivaroxaban may not be advised? What are the contraindications? What are the contraindications for its usage? So if you can see it clearly, if someone is hypersensitive, yes, you should not advise them. And if someone is, of course, having some clinically significant active bleeding as well, even at that moment, you should not advise them at all. Similarly, lesion of conditions at significant risk of major bleeding, for example, current or recent GI ulceration as well, you should not. Then someone is having a malignant neoplasm, you all know that neoplasms cancers are a higher risk of bleeding in fact or if someone has had a brain or spinal injury or even ophthalmic surgery or intracranial hemorrhage as well or someone has is having a history of esophageal varices or AV malformations or vascular aneurysm or intraspinal or intracerebral vascular abnormalities as well so that is the time you should not use it at all similarly concomitant when there is uh, a patient is receiving unfractioned heparin or low molecular weight heparin as well enoxaparin daltiparin or even with uh, treatment with heparin derivatives which is fondaparinox if you all will remember even other anticoagulants as well like the warfarin apixaban or dovicatrin etc then that is the time to not to uh, use rivaroxaban ideally. Similarly, if uh, uh, someone is receiving concomitant treatment with the antiplatelets for the acute coronary syndrome, so for example, especially someone who has had received a, a transient ischemic attack or even a prior stroke, or someone is having liver disease liver disease so what kind of liver disease you have to think for so the liver disease will like the child pug b and c types so because they can be associated with coagulopathy and yes if someone is pregnant or even breastfeeding the patients as well it's not advisable so we all know those what are those patients for having a high risk for the bleeding is someone is on anticoagulant therapy or someone is having renal disappearment, hepatic disappearment as well, or any of these uh, medicinal therapies. So what are those medical therapies which we need to be slightly more careful about? So we have to be slightly bit more careful about. So what are those drugs? So those drugs as well we will be trying to share so this is about the renal impairment so as we all know we consider renal failure when the creatinine clearance is less than 15 ml per uh, minute that is a time you should not use rivaroxaban at all in those kind of conditions you may prefer better using warfarin 
Although for the uh, moderate or severe, you can consider using a little lower dosages of rivaroxaban. And hepatic impairment, impairment, whatever, just stop. Why? Because they are coagulopathies. Otherwise, patients will be having bleeding problem for sure. Now, coming to the medications. So, for the commonly used medications like the clarithromycin, erythromycin, no interaction at all. Okay. And then, for example, uh, the what about the NSAIDs? So, with the NSAIDs, it is not advisable. You have to be slightly bit, just be a bit more careful in the sense with the low, uh, the same NSAIDs. If you are giving uh, acetyl salicylic acid or even the clopidogrel as well, so with them, be a little bit more careful when you are trying to give them uh, rivaroxaban. Otherwise, for the atovastatin, midazolam, or even the joxin, no need to be careful at all. So two, there are two conditions in which you have to be really careful. And what are those conditions is, if the patient is on HIV therapy, rivaroxaban should not be given. Second, for anti, for all the uh, antifungal agents, it should not be given at all, except fluconazole. If patient is on fluconazole, no problem at all. You can give them, okay? Otherwise, if the patient is on cytochrome P450, uh, 3A4 inducers like the rifampicin, phenytoin, carbamazepine, St. John's Ward, you should not at all give them this medicine at all. Okay. So these are some of those medicines uh, where you have to be careful. If you all will remember, as I had said, all antifungal agents are dangerous except fluconazole or any of these protease inhibitors or the HIV therapy drugs, you have to be really careful. And yes, as I had already said it, if someone is uh, on any anticoagulation therapy or those other having those hemorrhagic risk factors, ideally don't give them at all. So now coming to the what about those if someone has received an over, overdosage, uh, poisoning cases. So what, how are you going to manage them? So yes, uh, if you are trying to limit the absorption, you can try to give them charcoal as well. And then you may consider using one of the universal antidotes for the NOAX. So what is the universal antidote for NOAX? What is its name? The answer is there in my previous lectures, actually. So what is that universal antidote? So that is aripazine. Okay. So you can really use it for any of the NOACs, actually. Praxbine, I hope you all will remember, I had said it, it is for dabigatron only. So praxbine should be kept only for that. And the problem is, Dabigatron, if you all will remember, if there is overdosage with that, you can hemodialyze the patient, but not with rivaroxaban because it has a very high plasma protein binding. So if a patient comes with dabigatron toxicity, yes, you can dialyze them and it will be good, but not for rivaroxaban. Okay. So now, what if, if the patient has come to you with bleeding now? How are you going to treat? You can try to give them mechanical compression, surgical intervention, or even fluid treat replacement or hemodynamic support. But if the patient presents to you in a condition with life-threatening bleeding, then you may consider usage of PCC. What is PCC? Prothrombin complex concentrate or APCC as well, the activated one. A factor 7 a in fact so this is 
uh, trying to show you an overall view of the European Society Cardiology 2012 guidelines. So how to manage the bleeding with the NOAX. There are minor, uh, uh, the, the bleeding can be minor, moderate or very severe. And depending upon that, you have to try to take care of the management as well. And as we already said it for the very severe, you may consider the ECC or even Fracture 7A as well or try to use the charcoal filtration as well and tabicatron if you all will remember I had said it hemodialysis but not for the rivaroxaban at all like this uh, I think one of the other common condition which we all come across especially what about those patients if the patient is on no act and the patient needs surgery so how are you going to manage those kind of people so you can try to divide it in two ways, elective emergency. For the elective way, always stop one to two days before the surgery and you can start. However, if the patient needs an emergency procedure, so you can always, you should try to assess the benefit to risk ratio versus for the procedure. If the patient is having severe bleeding, then you may consider PCC. And then you may consider the surgery. Otherwise, you can give a little bit of gap. So for the surgery, it is ideal it is like 24 to 48 hours. And then, so what happens is, and wait for a few hours as well. You know, and then you are really sure that, okay, depending upon the clinical situation, when hemostasis has been established, a treating physician feels, yes, now it is done. That is the time you can restart with your dosage as well. So now coming to the elective surgery in patients receiving rivaroxaban. So what happens is the last tablet should be taken not less than 24 hours or 48 hours in high bleeding risk procedures before the intervention. And this applies to patients receiving any dosage of rivaroxaban. Okay, so after the surgical intervention, it should be restarted as soon as possible. Provider, of course, the clinical situation allows for this. Okay, and the adequate you have achieved the good amount of hemostasis. So now, what about the perioperative management, the dosage? So as we all know, it has a short half life. Bridging is not at all required and should not be done at all and in patients undergoing procedures with low risk of bleeding for example abscess incision simple tooth extraction the anticoagulant should be continued continuously it should not be stopped at all and wherever possible intervention around peak rivaroxaban you should try to avoid in the sense so for example when you have given the medicine at least two to four hours after that try to avoid that okay because you know when it is going to be in the peak activity the chances of bleeding or the complication chances may be higher for that so to summarize it's a great no act but it has some limitations as well so we have to be a bit careful especially we all know what happens is uh, we all know that uh, when we had been using warfarin, we have to monitor them. Drug to drug interactions are plenty. Then food to drug interactions are also quite a lot there. Uh, so rivaroxaban has its advantages in the sense the interactions are minimal. Chances of monitoring or let follow up is lesser, but definitely it is required as well. And one of the studies which had proven the role was rocket AF study that it has a more consistent and predictable anticoagulation profile while compared to the warfarin. So, Rocket AF had recommended once daily dosage itself and it is which is non-inferior to the warfarin. If you want to prevent the stroke or any kind of bleeding as well, the complication rates, for example, like overall bleeding or even lower rate of intracranial hemorrhage and fatal bleeds were seen with the rivaroxaban as well. So the efficacy which was seen in the clinical trial and even in the real life as well, it has been really good. 
and uh, it is also approved for the non-valvular AF and several more conditions as well which about which we all spoke about and there's a lot of extensive approach or studies which is going on right now to reduce the burden of thrombosis related diseases so do you all have any questions so far thank you so much for the patient hearing i would say i'm trying to take individual molecules one after the other because my main thinking is you all should have a deeper understanding you all should be able to develop that and that is what is my motive in fact as well and that is why we are trying to imp uh, take all these one after one by one these important drugs in fact so are there any questions so far Maybe everyone understood very well everything. So I hope everyone has understood everything. Otherwise, you can always keep your questions as well for the next session. I'll be more than happy to answer them in the next session, okay? So thank you so much everyone and I wish you all a wonderful day ahead.